Welcome to Chit Chat Money. Today is Tuesday, November 10th. Uh, I'm leaned back a little further in my chair than normal, so if I sound relaxed, I probably am. Yeah, everyone's everyone's going to love that, right? Yeah, um, but before we get to the show, we should mention uh, it's I'm doing the sales pitch this week, right? Yeah, your turn. Your okay, turn. so should I try the reverse psychology or? Yeah. Okay, I, uh, if I were you, I would not sign up for 7investing using the code CCM unless you really want uh, good returns in your portfolio, um, good stock picks, good analysis. You probably don't want any of that. So I would just yeah, make you, sure you don't sign up using CCM. Yeah, you don't want to use CCM at checkout and you don't yeah. want to get a team of personable, um, almost advisors that can help you out and also give great picks. And you also don't want that's the $10 last thing off. you want. The last thing you would want is to get $10 off your first month because that's a terrible deal. And it's almost like getting the first month for free when it's only going to cost you 7 bucks. Exactly. Uh, so yeah, don't use the code CCM. All right. You good? Yeah. Uh, we're ready are. to get to the um, real show? But what's your story today? Wait, before we get to that, uh, we have our interview with Richard Chu today and we talk uh, Teladoc. Lebongo, the old Teledongo, and then we yeah. also have Peloton as well. Yeah, so timely stuff. I know they're getting hit hard because of the vaccine news. They're, they're a lot of volatile stocks. So if you're interested in those companies at all, um, he was great, super smart about that. Yeah, okay. And then what's your story? Story is going to be Ant Financial uh, getting pulled. The IPO got pulled. A huge IPO is supposed to be $350 billion in Shanghai or Hong Kong, I believe. Uh, so giant story over there in the Chinese markets. Okay, and then I'm talking Square's earnings, which isn't really that compelling of a story, but it's a little interesting because it's somewhat controversial and there's a lot of debate going on with it. And then as always, we have our current state of FinTwit. Uh, we have hot water, buy, sell, hold, and anecdotal evidence. Let's go. Welcome to Chit Chat Money. On this show, hosts Ryan Henderson and Brett Schaefer interview industry experts and riff on the world of investing. As a quick reminder, Chit Chat Money is a CCM Media Group podcast. Ryan and Brett are not financial advisors. Anything discussed on Chit Chat Money by Ryan or Brett or any other podcast guest is not formal advice or a recommendation. Now please enjoy this episode. Okay, welcome in. I'm going to kick things off this week with Square's earnings. They had... They had a blowout quarter when you look at the top line, but there's some nuance to that. So we're going to get into uh, basically what all it was. But their total revenue was up 140% year over year to like three, I think it was three billion for the quarter. Uh, 54% of that revenue was Bitcoin revenue, which is zero margin, it's, essentially. It's almost like counting it as a gross market volume or, or merchandise volume, excuse right. me. You know? So it's, it should definitely, it should almost just be taken out. When you're and I, it. I think legally Square has to report that as revenue, even though it's essentially, yeah, like you said, they're not really taking any money on that. Yeah, it's just so the exchange of goods through that. If you're doing your own internal model, um, honestly, the best thing to do is just to subtract that revenue completely. Okay. And then, however, gross profit for all of Square was up 59% year over year, 63% if you exclude their sale of caviar. Uh, the number of d average daily transacting Cash App customers doubled year over year. Cash App gross profit grew 212% year over year. That's the number to look at if you're basing your thesis off Cash App is gross profit because that basically subtracts out all the Bitcoin revenue. Yeah, and the, the they're giving out gross profit right now, which probably indicates that the, it is not profitable. But if you're growing um, gross profit at 212%, that is a fantastic number. And it's the majority of the growth story for Square right now. And there's it feels like there's still some misunderstanding behind it because I've seen people go, okay, well, gross margin went from 40% to 26% in a year. And it's like, well, if their gross profit jumps 212%, do you really care what the margin is on it? Yeah. And then you just, again, make sure to subtract out that Bitcoin revenue. Don't get hung up on it of how, you know, it's it's misleading people. They, they put it in there right away, you know, and they explain how it's calculated, why it's going to be zero margin. Um, and then just don't get fooled when the total gross margin goes down. Look at it minus the Bitcoin revenue. Is the fact that 54% of their revenue coming from Bitcoin, uh, does that concern you? Uh, it's not concerning right now because I know that you know overall gross profit is going up and that's even better than total revenue going up. Uh, but it is concerning because it, it could be a way for them to hide uh, falling sales uh, in, in the future. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I have 
some hesitations around how much it'll actually drive uh, customers to other functions on the Cash App. Right. Like, I'm not sure people that are bringing money to the Cash App to buy Bitcoin are also there to get the cash card and get all the other features that the cash app provides. Yeah, I mean, I use the cash card um, and I use the cash app and I, I don't I don't care about Bitcoin at all. And that's just one use case. But yeah, I mean, I, focusing on the Bitcoin is not, I know it's back into the news and very trendy. It's just not the growth story for them. Maybe it's a gross, it's going to have a lot of volume flowing through the system if people are using it. But really, it's the cash card that you want to watch out for. It's the direct deposit with that bank account they have set up. They don't have a bank, but they, you know, they're partnering with one. Mm -hmm. It's going to make, I feel like, for some bad comps once Bitcoin sort of comes out of favor or like if it's less, you know, if less people start trading Bitcoin, it's going to make Square's comps look pretty bad. Yeah, and I guess that could be an opportunity if, again, gross profit and eventually the net income or free cash flow is getting better um, and, you know, revenue technically drops or the comps are really bad because bitcoin revenue was down um that could be a good opportunity i'm uh, just forecasting of how a lot of the people you know the short-term traders look at something like that you know yeah um in the markets outside the u.s the seller ecosystems gross payment volume grew 46 percent year over year that's a good sign yeah. um i guess the u.s is lagging behind in that regard but it also international seller gpv only makes up like 11 percent of overall gross payment volume for the seller ecosystem. So it's starting from a much smaller base. Yeah, there's a lot of potential internationally. I know Europe's a little more fragmented because there's not as many big box um, places. Well, I guess, I don't, I don't know, they're not really in big box places. You know how in, in the United States it's, it's a lot of standardized, but in Europe it's a lot of short you know places that take a lot of cash, um, cafes and things like that. But Australia, United Kingdom, um, a lot of other places, there's a bunch of potential there. But then in the United States, there's a lot more competition coming online. Uh, you have Clover, um, a few others. I know in Canada, there's Lightspeed. Yeah. Uh, and, and there's a bunch of other com competitors in the United States. So we might be getting close to saturation there. The revenue growth is probably not going to be where it was at like 40, 50%, like it was, you know, a few years ago. But, uh, you know, the market's not dead at all. They're still going to get money from these, from these sellers. Some other numbers, um, Sales and marketing expenses grew 133% year over year. Uh, the Square business card was really successful. I think it crossed $250 million in money being spent uh, through the Square business card. Um, just overall, it feels like sometimes the Cash App sort of overshadows the seller ecosystem because I think, pretty sure, uh, seller ecosystem only grew 8% GPV altogether. Yeah. Does that... Is that like cause for concern that the cat? Yeah, the cash app's doing really well, and I think we were right about the cash app. But the rest of the business, which generates a lot of subscription revenue, might not be doing so well. Yeah, and they get a lot of payment revenue where they get that two percent or three percent on the payments. Uh, I'd say 2021 is the year to look at because 2020, it's a little bit of anomaly. A lot of people were going bankrupt. Uh, you know, there was the COVID lockdown, stuff like that, that really hurt Square's seller business. But if they can continue to grow going into 2021, uh, you know, the comps will be fine. And I think that's just kind of an example. All right. In a normalized environment, the new normal environment, can Square still grow its gross payment volume and its revenue from its seller business? One, the concern is, though, the sales and marketing at 133%. Um, that just shows that their customer acquisition cost is increasing, uh, which decreases the lifetime value. Or sorry, you have to get a higher lifetime value for that to be a profitable customer. Um, if, you know, Everyone knows that if sales and marketing keeps increasing at a faster rate than revenue, they're never going to get to profitability. That's another thing to watch out for. Yeah. Are you more or less optimistic about Square moving forward after this quarter? Well, if you take into the valuation, I know it's come down today. Um, the valuation is up there. On the business itself, it's probably the same. I like the cash app a lot, and I think the seller business is solid. However, there's a lot of competition coming online for the seller business. I think the Cash App has a strong, you know, they're very innovative over at the Cash App, although they have a lot of competitors, you know, Venmo starting to copy a lot of their features. Um, I don't know. Uh, with the valuation higher, I'm obviously less optimistic for the stock compared to when it was below 100, but in the business, probably the same. Okay. All right. What's your story? 
story, uh, Ant Financial. So their IPO got pulled last week. It's a little bit of a drama story with Jack Ma. Uh, so the IPO was pulled by Chinese regulators right in the middle of the election, uh, which, shocker, uh, I guess, you know, hide the news on Monday and Tuesday. This Ant Financial is Jack Ma's baby, and it was supposed to net him a few billion dollars with the $40 million stock sale that was going to be in either Shanghai or Hong Kong. I believe it was probably Shanghai or Beijing then because it was the Chinese regulators. <clears throat> Uh, some facts about Ant Financial, it issues about one-tenth of all Chinese non-mortgage consumer loans, and Alipay is their biggest product. Uh, it is the thing that combined with Alibaba, it's sort of like their cash app or Venmo, except a lot bigger, and it's used more than cash or credit cards in China. Um, the storyline goes on November 2nd, regulators met with Mon so that in the future, financial inclusion from internet platforms would have to take a back seat to financial stability which sounds great, but that's kind of just their reasoning to take out this IPO. Um, it's very important to the Chinese stock market because the anti-IPO was to value the business at $359 billion, which would make it the largest financial institution in the world, um, larger than any bank, and at least you know by market cap. Uh, new, the new rules would state that it, companies would have to put up at least 30% of their own capital in making loans, and this became a problem with Ant because right now they're just a middleman, more of a matchmaker, and they have to only put up 2% of the loans because they're just connecting banks and customers. So it's kind of taking the middleman out of the equation. Now they're going to have to put up a lot of their own capital. Um, they're going to have to rework their business model, and that's going to take them a few months and maybe even a year before they're eligible for the public markets. So the trigger for this was the backlash from Ma poking fun at regulators at a conference. He lost upwards of ten billion dollars from this one speech. Is that the costly one of the costliest mistakes of all time, right there? I don't think he cares, but yeah, he's still worth like a few billion. So I don't know if he cares. He's probably gonna get the company's worth the same as it was, anyways. Uh, apparently, a lot of banks were lending vast amounts of money. Don't know the exact number. To people so they can invest in this IPO, which is an, a concerning anecdote. I don't yeah. know why, if, I, if hundreds of thousands of people in the United States were getting loans to invest in the new IPO, what's the big one, like Snowflake? Um, that's a concerning number to me. I get it when banks do it. Um, it's not, it doesn't make them special. You know, going on leverage, just, you know, it's dangerous either way if you're smart or just a retail investor, but <laughs> that concerns you, right? I don't like investing on borrowed money to begin with. Uh, and yeah, I mean, if you're doing it for some hot new IPO, it, that makes it that much more suspect. Yeah, it was, that, that was a concerning anecdote. I saw um, the users of the app told the Financial Times that the app was designed so people unwittingly take out loans to shop at Alibaba. So in its offering documents, Ant said that Credit Tech Unit, which is the thing that we're talking about here, is now 39% of total sales. Uh, which is a large part and is actually their biggest growth driver. Uh, so this is an important part of the story for Ant Financial and is why they pulled back the IPO because if they couldn't do this business, the market cap they would get would be a lot lower. Now, if you're confused on what this actually is, think of some American examples so people can get some, uh, you know, if you're a listener and you're thinking, how, how are these companies like something in America? It's kind of like if Amazon owned Venmo, 80% of the country used Venmo on a regular basis and then it started partnering with banks to lend money to people just so they could shop on Amazon. Uh, and then banks also lent money so they could buy Amazon. Yeah, stock. it seems um, a bit concerning. And this is one of the reasons when I hear stories about this all the time, you know, it's almost on a weekly basis, maybe minimum of a monthly basis, depending on what is happening in the Chinese markets. As someone who has no access over there, I just can't get myself to want to invest. What was this thing about them being like, levered up 100 to 1 yeah i saw that um it could have been wrong because i didn't investigate that it's just something i tweeted like wow someone someone tweeted an article that said they levered up 100 to 1 um it might be a little different because they're a middleman but uh if they're levering up a lot even if it's not actually 100 to 1 even if it's 10 to 1 or 20 to 1 uh if the values of those loans go down only you know 10 percent or so you're in a lot of trouble yeah it just it echoes our concerns about investing in Chinese companies and it's not necessarily I'm not bashing Ant Financial but there's like regulatory risk that you can't foresee obviously you probably couldn't have invested in this because it hadn't gone public but there's just so much government involvement yeah okay I hate that yeah it's almost like 
all right, someone, I guess we just talked about Square today. It's almost like if Square could get constrained just because the government can just decide that no one can use the cash app anymore. All right, then the business is screwed. Yeah. And I mean, I'm not sure what Jack Ma, if he has anything to do with Alibaba anymore, but it's like once the government has sort of an issue with a person that can affect their other businesses too. Yeah. Like yeah. this could, I think Alibaba was down like 6% on the news of yeah. financial not going public. So there's too much like entanglement there. It's like, just way too much concern and risk for me as an investor. Oh, yeah. And I think what happened was Jack Ma thought he was above the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party. He thought he could say whatever he wants now. And they were like, no, no, no. Not even our richest guy. He's yeah. not immune to right. our uh, our autocratic needs. All right. Current state of the Fentwit, you want to yeah. go first? Sure. I'll, I'll go first. And I basically uh, – this week, Fentwit basically just became election Twitter. True. Um, and so – Or comparing gonna... it to value. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that too. Stuff. I'm not gonna say like anything political, but doesn't this week, election week, always amplify the Twitter bull thesis? Yeah, because I am refreshing that I am refreshing Twitter more than I like probably ever have. Yeah, if they had, if they were a subscription model or something, they got first off get the ads to work. If there's no way for the ads to work, you got to come up with a better business model. Um, we talk about this all the time. You're providing more value than you're getting in for it. There was, so, a, there, was, that. there was a period where I was getting relevant ads, and now they're back to, like, the least relevant ads I've ever had. Yeah, it's I bad. don't need a GMC truck, and yeah. I've never tweeted about trucks in my life. Like, well, it's – Dorsey's, like, resistance to collecting data, I feel like is just screwing him. I, think they, I mean, they it. collect data. They're just really bad at executing it. What What – what data points are they collecting? I no, I mean they're just my they're, age and my gender. I'm sure they're collecting the same data points as Facebook, uh, but they're just really they just don't have the data analysts and stuff to do it. They don't have the algo. If Twitter ends up being like a crazy successful investment, let's say it's a trillion dollar company, like Facebook might be here soon. Maybe they already are. I would say no way Twitter, but okay, two hundred billion or something. If they were, would this be the most obvious miss? Uh, I mean, everyone knew how valuable it was. Yeah, they were just like, "What's the CEO? Isn't he's not doing anything?" I think it should be a cash cow. I don't think, see it being a trillion dollar business, but could they turn things around and get up to two hundred billion dollars? Sure, they have some really valuable users. Their ARPU should be high. Yeah, yeah. All right, what did you have? Okay, today was the biggest day in value history. Everyone's talking about value being back because of the vaccine news. Is this a head fake, do you think? Is this just the market gods tormenting all the quantitative value guys? I was I woke up pretty hyped this morning. So it, the day we're recording this was the news that uh, Pfizer broke with the yeah. vaccine thing. Monday and, morning. And then I saw a thread that was like, this really isn't going to help for like a year and a half. And it was sure, it was it was Max from Seven Investing. Yeah, and so I'm like, all right, well, it feels like the markets are going to come back down to earth at some point, and they're going to be like, yeah, this really doesn't impact anything for a while. Yeah, and it it's tough when you look at the individual companies. You really got to make a case by case basis, but uh, it could be a proponent to help in in total the value companies because then they're going to be able to hopefully pay down any of their debt because a lot of them are in the value. Can't because they're Leo levered up a ton. Yeah. I have no idea if it's a head fake though, uh, but it is interesting to see a value outperform by like 7% on one day, or I think maybe it was small cap value that was that high. I don't, uh, just to see like people competing, you know? I just don't see that. Yeah. Maybe, all right. Good. Value had their day. It's been a rough decade for them, so good for them. But it to me, like I'm not gonna stop shopping online now. Like I'm not ecstatic about going and seeing well, traffic again. That's not like, what it's about. It's it's the price you pay. Obviously, you're not Amazon's not gonna be in the value bucket. But are you gonna pay for Amazon at seventy times earnings, or are you gonna pay for uh, I don't know the company example? Are you gonna pay for another company at six times earnings? That's the question you have to ask, and it's a lot harder one to make. I don't think it changes. I think people need something to react to i don't think it changes the thesis for a lot of the oh the individual names. other than yeah. maybe other than maybe zoom purely pace purely based on just people not using it as much but at the yeah. same time it's subscription based and everyone's gonna need 
I am I imagine everyone's probably going to keep a Zoom subscription if you work for a business. Yeah, the individual companies it could be like if you see the sell off on an individual company, I mean this is a great opportunity if you think it's trading at a 20% discount or maybe even 10% discount and you think all right, well they're classifying this as a work from home stock, but it's still going to be fine. Uh well, all right, that's a good opportunity for you to buy shares for the long term. But on the flip side, when this first started, people were like and and we saw quarterly earnings, uh, whatever that first quarter was, where it reflected March. Yeah, and second COVID. quarter. Yeah, second quarter. And they were like, uh, everyone's like, no, this is not a temporary boost. This is a permanent change. This eh. is everyone's going this way. We're gonna see that in the next year, year and a half. We're gonna see. Okay, is work from um, home here to stay forever? Because I think the market said today that maybe a lot of these were temporary shifts. I think the easiest. Uh, the one that I'm very confident is going to happen is when things open up, when everything is safe or is 90% safe, people are going to spend on travel and entertainment and, you know, outside entertainment, you know, going to places, going to restaurants, going to bars. They're going to spend on that like crazy. I'm I'm like I, 95% yeah. confident in that. No, big time. I Like, I'm going to go to a movie theater as soon as I can, probably. Yeah. So is AMC good? AMC was up like 40% today. I wonder if that no bond way. I wonder if that bond uh idea I had that that half baked idea would actually work. Uh, Never invest like that though. If uh, All right, is that, that all you had for current state of Fintech? All I had. Okay, next we have our interview with Richard Chu. We did have some technical issues during the interview. So I think, yeah, I think Brady I, over here chopped them up real well, but yeah, I think our man behind the glass uh was able to sort of smooth it out but if you hear yeah. any blips you probably know why what did you like from the interview uh definitely information on lavongo and teledoc uh he goes into the telemedicine industry uh learning about that what kind of things matter what's a commodity what's actually providing value how you can build a competitive advantage in that um i'll probably this is one of the ones i'm gonna have to listen to again because some things went a little bit over my head which i think is great because if you listen to it you're gonna learn a lot yeah and i I yeah I second all that and I don't always listen to our own interviews because I don't like hearing myself but this is one that I'm gonna look forward to hearing Richard's answers again so um, I hope you guys enjoy the interview here you go today we are welcomed by Richard Chu um, before we get started here Richard why don't you kind of give us the thumbnails of your career so far uh, what led you to investing and then what made you want to become an analyst? Sure. So, um, I, uh, so for anyone who doesn't know, um, I am, uh, like I have my own Twitter account, um, Richard Chu 97. I also have my own sub stack, um, where I mm. sort of go over, um, my own story in more detail. And then I also do like a number of different deep dives on different companies such as Lavongo, Agora, um, and, uh, more, more recently go health. Um, and uh, just to uh, sort of give you like a background of my uh, career so far, it hasn't been like too long, I guess, since I started investing. Um, I uh, basically started back in around like mid 2018. And that was because mostly um, I'm not too old myself, like I'm um, just turned 23. And uh, I think that um, at, at that time I was still in university, so I didn't really have that much disposable income to be investing. Um, and so like during the time I was working, I was doing an internship and I uh, had some like extra cash laying around and I figured that uh, why not start like checking out um, investing in personal finance. So I read this uh, book. I think like a lot of young investors might be familiar, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. It's a book on personal finance that a lot of people uh, start with. And from that book, like, it really sort of sparked my interest in investing. It really introduced like concepts like um, the power of compound interest, for example. And uh, this was like all stuff that I was learning back at school at the time um, because I was studying business, but it wasn't like something that uh, really like, 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 I, like I don't think many people sort of get an interest in uh, investing um, from just their schoolwork because it's very theory based. So Rich Dad Poor Dad really taught me sort of the practical um, implications of investing and uh, the importance of starting early, the importance of um, sort of um, 
learning to invest for yourself. And so that's what I did. Um, and ever since then, I've just been learning and learning, um, improving my own investing and trying to sort of maximize my returns um, in any way I can. And uh, so back in uh, sort of last December, December 2019, I got comfortable enough with my own investing acumen to want to uh, start my own Twitter um, because I was working at the time um, as a technology consultant at EY. And um, at that job, um, I realized that I actually want to do investing full time as a career. And I didn't want to sort of uh, continue doing um, technology consulting, but I didn't really have any sort of finance experience. And so I figured that Twitter um, and like starting to write my own articles would be a good way to build my track record because at the time I was very bullish on Livongo Health. Um, and that was really because I uh, like, like, like if there was any idea that um, I would sort of place a bet and place like a bet on, then it would be that stock. And I wanted to also like sort of get credit and like kind of help people kind of like open people's eyes to uh, the stock before like I thought that it would take off. And so I started out by doing like a short thread on Twitter, just like saying why Livongo is my top 2020 pick. And I followed that up by doing an article on Seeking Alpha. And I thought that uh, that really caught a lot of people's attention. Um, one other thing that I did was because um, Saga Partners, um, they owned a position in Livongo at the time. And because they um, saw my article, they uh, really liked it and they reached out to me. So that also helped because it put me in contact with them. And we started talking, exchanging emails over the past couple of months. And then um, luckily I was able to actually realize my um, dream of like working in investing by uh, like working on the buy side by uh, getting an offer from them um, back in August. So ever since then, I've just been building up my Twitter following, just looking at providing as much value as I could um, through both my tweets and through uh, the articles that I've done. And uh, it's been great so far at Saga as well. So I'm really glad to share more. Did you have like a sort of a special industry or a niche or like, um, was there anything you were drawn to when you first started investing or was it kind of broad? Um, well, I think that it was mostly kind of broad. Um, I thought that I st like my own um, journey started in a, a way that's very similar to most people in terms of just investing in the stocks that I knew. At the time, I didn't know anything about SaaS because I wasn't in the field. Like I don't have a technology background. I didn't know anything about um, digital health. Um, so at the start, like I started by investing in stocks that uh, most people my age knew about, like Facebook, um, Tesla, and um, from there, like I explored, like I read a lot, I explored different sectors, and it was a while later that I sort of discovered um, that I want to focus in on SaaS and digital health. I think that those two, um, like, especially like the SaaS business model, like I think that it's um, very, very powerful and the market is sort of realizing that now it's very, very safe, even in um, recessionary uh, times, like, like um, what just happened with COVID. And I think that uh, just um, sort of the appeal, like the long-term growth, long-term growth prospects for both industries um, really drew me to them. And uh, that's where I sort of focused my energy recently and building my circle of competence in that area, as opposed to uh, sort of being more of a generalist. Right, right. Now, how has writing um, helped? I know you got a sub stack going now. Uh, got a lot of, you know, got a lot of people following that. Um, how has that helped you in investing? Um, so, like, I think that writing really helps build you, your conviction um, because it forces you to, like, really think through your thesis from every possible angle, like looking at the competition, looking at the products, um, risks, um, the industry as a whole. And it really takes a lot of time to gather that research, right? So, if you put it in sort of like a writing format, if you like force yourself to like write like this um, in-depth article and uh, really cover all your bases there, like I think that that sort of really helps build your conviction. Um, now I will say that like just because I write an article on the stock doesn't mean that I'm going to be married to that stock. Um, like 
on Twitter, like um, some people have been like sort of critical of like um, me sort of writing an article and then sort of trimming the stock like a couple of months later. Like critical I did that on with... Twitter? No, no, I never, I never <laughs> hear that. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I've been uh, sort of like 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 people are asking questions about like you know like um, I wrote an article on Elastic and then I uh, sort of sold out after their uh, earnings report like a couple of weeks later and then I wrote like another article on Agora and I uh, sort of trimmed that stock a couple of weeks later, um, not because of anything related to um, the company itself, but because of Zoom sort of entry, which I didn't expect to come this soon. Um, like, like Zoom recently launched like a customizable SDK and they're using like a lot of the same terminology. So that kind of spooked me a bit. Um, and uh, yeah, like, like, like I think that you, uh, like, like, like when you're writing about a stock, you gotta be, sort of open to that kind of criticism and um just because i write about it doesn't mean that sort of i'm actually gonna hold on to that stock forever or like um not ignore the risks associated with it like if anything right. i think that writing about a stock really opens your eyes to like all the possible risks and sometimes just be, and, and sometimes i'll like write about a stock and not even take a position because there was something that i didn't realize that i didn't like about it yeah it feels like sometimes you go in optimistic and as sort of as you put your thoughts down on paper you start to think maybe there's some flaws in my thesis uh but a company or two companies i guess that you've been pretty vocal about is teladoc i think it's your largest holding by a long ways right like yeah 40 percent or something like that yeah. um so when you first heard about the merger what was your initial reaction um well like like i'll say that i first um First of all, like I had like a large position in Livongo before. Um, it was around like 20% of my portfolio. I didn't have a position in Teladoc at the time. So when I first heard about the merger, I was kind of disappointed just like a lot of people were um, because sort of I saw like, I wanted to own Livongo, which was this really like high growth um, sort of uh, um, rem like remote patient monitoring company that I thought had a really, really bright future by itself. And it was in a better position than Teladoc. Um, and so I was kind of disappointed that they would merge because of course, like it was no longer a hyper growth company. Um, and I didn't really like Teladoc as much and I'll go into that later, but, uh, yeah, like at first I was kind of disappointed, but then after doing more research, I figured that like, Hey, like Lavongo, like management, like they knew that they had something very, very special with the company and why would they want to sell this early? Like. A lot of people were saying maybe um, there was something wrong with the company that the rest of us didn't know about that Lavongo management probably uh, hid. But I think that's too that's too uh, cynical. Like I think that um, they like like in the past like they've repeatedly expressed and within the merger documents itself like they've repeatedly expressed um, how bullish they were on the future of the company and they negotiated hard for that 10% premium because the stock like it rose like in like like it basically doubled in the span of a month. So. Mm -hmm. I don't think like it's too um, fair to be very critical of Lavongo management for making that move, especially when Teladoc itself paid like, like um, what was it like, like 30 times next year's sales for Lavongo. That was like a huge premium. And that would clearly show that Lavongo had something special that was worth paying for. And so I dive deeper into how the synergies um, would benefit both companies. And I love what I saw. So I, instead of selling, I um, started adding and I'm still adding to, to this day. Yeah, it felt like when it happened, I, I owned a little bit of Livongo at the time as well. It felt like when it happened, it was almost a crush to a lot of shareholders. Like we, we had this long runway to grow and maybe management didn't see it the same way. Um, but like you said, the merger seems, people are optimistic about the merger now. Uh, but you said you weren't that optimistic about Teladoc beforehand. Why weren't you, uh, I guess, excited about Teladoc on its own? Yeah, so like I saw like um, basically the future of virtual care is going to be providing the right care, so personalized care, the right care to the right person at the right time. And Teladoc, it only solves sort of the right time like like um and and like sort of the right place like you can like have like on demand um telemedicine visits at your home and you can like sort of um 
like 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 it saves you like a lot of time and it also saves sort of the provider time because they don't have to worry about stuff like cancellations or whatever but um at the same time like it's not going to be solving sort of the issue of uh like healthcare costs in this country because you know like the doctor is still going to be spending the same amount of time with each patient and really the key is with Lavongo is going to be sort of providing like 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 sort of uh really looking at your entire population and monitoring them constantly and using that data that you collect in order to determine sort of the exact right time to provide that care and personalize that care using the data that sort of is collected by Lavongo's connected devices. So I think that Lavongo is a step forward ahead of Teladoc. And you already saw that they partnered with a bunch of other telemedicine companies like, Do like Doctor on Demand and MD Live. Um, and I really saw them sort of has having sort of the advantage here. And I think Teladoc did as well, which is why they were so adamant on buying them. And I think that um, really, when you look at telemedicine companies as a whole, it's really sort of a services business. Like it's a more of a commodity, right? Like um, Teladoc really won based on their scale, based on their execution. And I think that's um, something that sort of can be uh, eroded over time because really what's the benefit of scale? Like you have um, Teladoc, which has like, 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 like physicians, like a huge network of physicians but it's the same thing like uber right like once you meet sort of a certain um level of of uh patient of uh, uh, like of uh physicians then you can sort of pump out like these on-demand visits you you don't need like hundreds of thousands of doctors to be able to really um do that um of course like with teledoc scale like they're able to scale up really really quickly and you saw that because they were able to handle covid much much better than the other telemedicine companies um, but scale alone i don't think it's enough because at the product level fundamentally each patient doesn't really care if you get your services from teledoc or amwell or any of the other telemedicine providers um, as long as it's covered by your insurance um, and as long as you don't have to wait an hour to get it I don't think it really matters. So the moat was a bit light there. Um, and really, I think that that was a problem that Lavongo would be solving because Lavongo, I think it has a really, really wide moat. Okay. Okay. That, that makes a lot of sense. And they've talked about uh, the companies having a lot of, you know, quote synergies together. I think they mentioned $500 million in potential cross sell by like 20, yeah. Whatever I think it might have been 2025. I mean, what benefit does it provide to you know the shareholders of each of these companies? Um, or is there anything besides just cost savings that that'll work out here? Yeah. So like I feel like um, overall, basically the merger really extended uh, TAM as well as the moat for both companies. And the reason why they did that is like like for one, like we already know, like everyone knows that they're both dominant in their own fields and they're both already at scale and that can't be said for any of their um, major competitors. Like they're both dominating their spaces and really combining them, you're creating sort of the sort of the dominant sort of virtual care uh, player here. Um, but that's not really my thesis, right? Like my thesis goes beyond that and I think that really is sort of the value that's going to be unlocked by integrating their two platforms, integrating their capabilities, is going to be um, opening up sort of new pathways to reshape healthcare fundamentally. And the reason why I say that is because um, once you have sort of this feedback loop where you have like Lavango's data feeding into Teladoc's physician network, who can then use that data to provide sort of customized, better, um, on-demand care to patients, both acute and chronic, um, I think that that is really going to open up pathways to sort of build this longitudinal relationship with a patient. So like over the entire sort of care journey from the primary care exam all the way to like providing mental health care, all the way to providing like possibly in the future um, drugs as well. And I think that um, that really opens up sort of new opportunities in terms of payment models because once you're sort of managing 
that care throughout the entire journey, like that's something that can't be said for most of the healthcare system today because it's so disjointed, right? Like you have like um, one health uh, system, like, 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 like one provider for like handling your primary care, another one for handling your mental health and none of them ever talk to each other. So like what happens when you have like an issue with your mental health that your primary care provider doesn't know about? So like, because they can't talk to each other, they can't really provide the best personalized care and they don't have the data either. So really integrating Livongo into all of that really provides that capability. And what I mean with the payment models is that right now, a major source of waste within the healthcare system, like 25% of healthcare spending is wasted, right? So, and that's a lot of it is due to a uh, fee for service. Fee for service meaning that um, it incentivizes physicians, providers to provide as many services as possible in order to get reimbursed by the greatest amount. Mm -hmm. And really you're seeing sort of a gradual shift to more value-based care and what value-based care are like fixed fee payments, like what they really are is like you pay like sort of a fixed fee, like under like different models, like capitation, bundle payments, shared savings, shared risk, whatever. Um, you provide sort of that fixed fee to sort of the health plan and the health plan sort of takes charge of all of those patients um, and they have to manage their patient costs their like all their conditions in a very cost effective way in order to sort of not overspend and see negative profits and they're also being tracked on the quality of the outcomes so really like you're seeing that system that really aligns sort of incentives for like all the different players and what that results in ultimately is better care for a lower price. And so I think that that is going to be the future of the healthcare system, no matter um, who like is like um, under the White House. Like I think that um, this is definitely like what we're gradually moving towards. And what you're seeing Teladoc do is they're the technology layer that really enables that kind of system to really thrive. So you're going to see health plans adopting more and more Teladoc in order to empower sort of their value-based offerings, I think. Right. And I mean, we know telemedicine has gotten a big bump from uh, COVID. Uh, you know, all the companies have been doing well. Um, I think they saw triple digit revenue growth combined uh, between the two. I didn't really crunch the numbers, but they both had phenomenal quarters, but the market kind of um, discounted that and maybe thought, well, I mean, let's see you prove it in a not a uh, tailwind environment. What makes you think that this growth is sustainable as opposed to a temporary boost? Well, like a lot of people talk about how COVID was really sort of the iPhone moment for digital health in terms of like, 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 like the spark that really sort of opened up like a universe of possibilities. And what I mean by that is that, you know, like from both a uh, societal standpoint, like you're seeing patients all over the country, they're being exposed to telemedicine, they're being exposed to the merits of telemedicine. People in rural areas, right, like they don't want to like travel for like a two hour commute just to see their doctor for like a bee sting. And I think yeah. that, um, yeah, and, and I think that really like you're like seeing patients argue for this. You're seeing providers now, they're being forced to do it because they don't want to lose their patients. Like they, like, like, like the patients only can see you through telemedicine, then you're going to have to offer that option. Otherwise they'll go to someone else. And you're really seeing that both way adoption from both physicians and uh, patients. And that's also happening at sort of the high level, the regulatory level, like you're seeing sort of regulations really opening up. And because healthcare was such a regulated industry before, like this has totally changed the game. Because before, like, you couldn't even see patients at their own homes. Like, you could provide telemedicine services. You, like, like um, physicians, like, they had to only provide in-state and to uh, patients at sort of the right place. But, like, now, like, sort of that's all opening up because of COVID. And physicians, like, they can now see patients across all states as well. And you're seeing things like equal payments, so, like, reimbursing health systems at the same level for telemedicine visits as you're doing in-person visits. And that's really sort of um, boosting adoption because making telemedicine a fundamentally more convenient product. And that's already being made permanent by um, forces within the government. There's bipartisan support for telemedicine. 
So what do you think, we always sort of try to ask ourselves this when we own a company, uh, what can go wrong? What do you think could potentially go wrong with the merger? Is there anything, I guess, what are you looking for where your thesis would either be busted or it's a total change in your thesis? Well, I'd say like um, mainly it's concerns around execution risk. So making sure that um, Teladoc doesn't sort of lose Lavango's focus, patient focus. I think that a lot of people have criticized Teladoc as being more of a acquisitive entity, really just adding on all of these bolt-on acquisitions rather than that, sort of making sure that they all play together in order to create more of an integrated experience. Um, and also making sure that management, Teladoc management, like I think at Lavongo, um, a lot of the high level people have left. Like you saw Jennifer, she was the president left. Um, Zane, he was a CEO left. Um, like Hamant and um, Glenn, like they're like Glenn is the chairman of Lavongo and Hamant was um, a sort of this, uh, like, like, like he's a general catalyst of EC firm and he helped build Lavongo with Glenn. Um, they're still staying on the board. Um, but I think that from a high level, like you're seeing like a lot of these people leave and that introduces more execution risk. Um, what I will say to that is that um, Jason, who is the Teladoc CEO, he has a really great vision, I think. He has talked about entering into chronic care from the very start since their IPO. That was like five years ago. And he's talked about entering chronic care. He's talked about remote patient monitoring. He's uh, new. He's he's known to like enter the employer market before the provider market because the provider market wasn't developed at the time. So he's been making all the right moves so far. And so I think that I'm pretty confident in his abilities to really integrate Lavango as well. And I think on the other side, you can really look at how competition is pretty strong too because it's such a big space. Like you're seeing all sorts of different players enter. You see United Health with Optum. Um, and you see like other like um, PBMs, like CVS, like they're all building out their own solutions for this. But I think like, it's the same thing that you see in a cloud market, right? Like, like these big players, like they don't have to focus. They don't have sort of um, the incentive right now, I think, because really what you're seeing with these insurers is that they're incentivized to keep their premiums up. Like they're incentivized to keep raising the premiums. And, if you have something like Teladoc, if you have something like Lavongo that employers, like self-insured employers can directly go to, then I think you're gonna see more and more go directly to Teladoc. And if these um, insurers don't offer Teladoc, then people are gonna sort of buy Teladoc, go directly to Teladoc. It's gonna be sort of this, um, like, 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 the powers, like the power of the integrated platform is gonna be so big that, uh, um, other like health plans have no choice but to uh, sort of buy Lavongo and Teladoc. And, uh, and management has already sort of talked with a bunch of industry stakeholders who have said the same thing. So how would you measure or sort of track how they're executing? Is it, is it any number? Is it far more qualitative like management turnover or um, customers that are unsatisfied? How would you kind of, what are you looking at for that? Yeah, like, um, of course, I like attract like the financials, like I want to make sure that, you know, like growth stays up. Um, and they've projected like some great numbers for next year, like I think it was 40 to 45% revenue growth before synergies. So definitely, like if they um, aren't able to meet those targets, then I'll be concerned. Um, I also think that uh, really, it's important to look at sort of how well like they're um, executing on sort of my story here like they're going to be launching virtual primary care next year and that is really going to be sort of the force that i think really combines both offerings together so i really want to see how adoption for that takes off all right the next company we want to talk about is peloton i believe you own them as well so just uh generally what do you like about them yeah, so um, Peloton is a relatively smaller position. Like I acknowledge that there um, is some merit to the bear thesis. Um, but I think that overall, like I really liked sort of the company. I think that they have a huge opportunity. Um, actually, if you don't know, like I own sort of a Peloton bike myself. I recently purchased it and um, I really love it. Like I think that it's really a huge step up from any of the other sort of exercise equipment that I've owned as well as um, sort of being better than going to the gym. Um, I think like for myself, 
I uh, am not like a huge gym person, um, but um, that was sort of the appeal of the Peloton because I kind of like video games and um, so our Peloton is really gamifying the whole um, sort of exercise, um, sort of uh, like, like connective fitness and everything. Um, it's really gamifying um, the whole experience. And with metrics like being able to compete against your friends, being able to really um, compete against all these other people, and then especially being your personal best over time, like that really motivates you, like having all that data um, and being able to track your progress on like a minute by minute basis. Like I think that's something that doesn't exist when you're going to the gym, like you're kind of having to rely more on your self-discipline. And I think that uh, really with uh, Peloton, um, it's sort of like a really um, aspirational brand. Like a lot of people, you know, like um, post on social media, like, hey, like I got a Peloton. And then all their friends are like, wow. Um, so I think that there is definitely um, that component for a lot of people. Um, I also think that uh, really like it's, something that um like like with the leaderboard being patented and like really um like i think they're hiring some other engineers like unity engineers to like further gamify the experience like i think that uh really it's sort of creating um this sort of friendly competitive environment it's really higher energy environment with the instructors and with like music and everything um you know like when you play video games like a lot of people um sort of you know grind for stuff and like what that basically means is like they spend like hours and hours doing like these really repetitive sort of tasks um, and they do it in order to level up and feel that sort of instant gratification and that's something that really Peloton is bringing to fitness where on in like a minute by minute basis you can see your progress and you get addicted to that data you get addicted to that feedback and that keeps people coming back so I think like it's really sort of something very unique that they've spearheaded here. And uh, I think that's quite disruptive to sort of the old way of doing things like traditional gyms. Right, and people talk about the community part of Peloton. Is there any competitive um, advantage with that? Is that gonna give them any sort of moat over, um, I think there was a rumor that Amazon, it might've been a fake uh, product, but there was a rumor that Amazon was gonna launch, um, Apple's launching into this too. Um, is there any sort of moat with just the community part of it? Yeah, like I think like it's definitely a huge moat that I underestimated um, when I first looked at it. Like there's definitely some network effects there. And basically, like as I mentioned, it's kind of like a social network where you can add your friends, you can video chat with them when you're riding the bike, and you can like even put like tags on there. Like there's been like over a hundred thousand tags created by seven hundred and ninety-five thousand members. Um, and then the tags range from like stuff like Peloton teachers, like um, Peloton preggers, like like um, pregnant women, um, like 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 army vets, like all that kind of different stuff. And uh, that really sort of there's like communities within communities. And like you go on Facebook when you buy a Peloton, you're invited to the group, and you see like people posting there all the time about how Peloton has changed your life. And I think that um, really it's this very tight knit community. Um, that they've created here and that not only helps build the brand but it also helps welcome other people because you know like if you're on Peloton you can race against your friends you can track each other's progress and not only that but you can sort of validate each other by like you say, hey like, like like hey I got a Peloton you got a Peloton too like 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 it's sort of something like a brand that everyone wants kind of like Tesla you know um, so yeah like I feel like definitely community is a huge is a huge uh, no. Do you think people will, or do you think the product sort of has an upgrade cycle, kind of like an iPhone? Do you think, I mean, it's a $2,000 bike. Um, Built to I, last, you know? And I have heard, I mean, I've heard nothing but great things from the users. Do you think people will upgrade over, let's say like five years, they'll go out and buy a new bike? Yeah, I definitely think they would. Um, you know, like the evidence that we have so far is like they've already launched a bike plus and it's exceeded all of their expectations. Like last wow. earning call, they were talking about how supply chain is a big issue because they're struggling to meet with demand for the bike. Um, they also like 
underestimated the amount of people who would be keeping their existing bike. Like, you know, like um, people who already owned a bike, the original bike, they want to upgrade. Um, they like Peloton thought that they would uh, trade in their old bike so they can like sort of kickstart, you know, like their used Peloton um, bike program. But uh, that turns out to be not the case because a lot of people were actually keeping their old bikes and giving it away to like family members um, and then plus as well. So it's been um, really uh, sort of um, shocking in terms of the demand for that right now. And I think that uh, even though it's very expensive, that it's still like a brand that um, a lot of people want these days. So I can definitely see how people will keep sort of upgrading it. Like, even though like it seems to you and me, like, um, like I personally bought like the original bike because I didn't really see sort of how the bike plus was enough to warrant sort of the premium. And they still like expect the bike, the original bike to be their best selling product going into 2021. Um, but I think that um, the bike plus is going to work for a lot of people. Not only that, but they're also going to come out with different more fitness items. Like they have the Peloton tread and they're getting into uh like, like they could get into uh, strength as well. Like you see other t startups in the place like Tonal, um, they have like those uh, strength workouts. Um, so yeah. All right, who do you think Peloton's target audience is? Um, I know some people think that their uh, addressable market might be a little limited with the expensive bikes and the fact that they're gonna compete with gyms when they open up. Could they get to 100 million members? Um, is that an achievable goal for them? Um, yeah, like they've um, talked about like their big audacious goal being like 100 million members. Um, and I think that that is definitely something very admirable to aim for. They talk about how there's like 200,000 gym goers right now in the US and how they're paying for access to really inferior fitness equipment at sort of um, an inferior location as opposed to having it on demand, very, very high quality fitness content right under like like um like within their homes and so like i think that uh really it's going to be like a huge potential market because not only you have like the gym goers but you also have people who own the like their own fitness equipment like i think like they said around uh 35 million u.s households have a treadmill already so um that 200 million gym goers like those could be all potential peloton digital um, members because like you know like you see people who even like if they don't have Peloton the bike the actual bike they go with like a third-party bike like um, like uh, Nautilus has a few and uh, um, like like a bunch of others as well and uh, I think that people recognize the high quality of Peloton's content so they pay for that subscription there and so um, it's really a huge market for their content and that content really um, sort of gets people on the path to eventually owning their own Peloton bike um, themselves. So really it's like this um, huge market of not only uh, gym goers, but also people like me who weren't necessarily very, very um, active gym goers myself, but uh, really saw the appeal of the Peloton and how that that sort of uh, really could change like a bunch of uh, potential gripes of like why people don't work out regularly. Yeah. And I've, yeah. So I've heard stories a lot like yours, Richards, where it's, uh, you know, I, I wasn't really that into going to the gym, but when I got the chance to do that at home, I loved it. And historically companies that have sort of uh, fanatic consumers, com uh, consumers that love the product tend to do pretty well. I might be missing some, but Apple and even Tesla, uh, customers like that. Uh, but we're going to get into a wrap up question. So these are our last two. I'll hit the first one. What is one financial saying that you disagree with? Um, so I think one financial saying that I disagree with probably would be diversifying for the sake of diversifying. Like I see so many people, like when they first start investing, they're like, Hey, like I got to own like 10% of my portfolio in tech stocks, 10% of my portfolio in industrials, 10% in energy, 10% in financials, 10% um, in consumer staples. And you sort of get like this mishmash of like stocks that maybe like 
you might not be an expert in that industry, um, but um, you like um, still own them just because you like like you think like it's too dangerous to like keep all your eggs in sort of this one basket of maybe like tech stocks, for example. Like people look at my portfolio and I've got some comments about like, hey, like why are you like 100% of your portfolios in like digital health and SaaS? Um, shouldn't you diversify more? And I think like, first of all, like when you look at a company like let's say uh, Cloudflare, um, it's running mission critical services for 101,000, I think, paying customers across every single industry and globally as well. So you really have the extreme diversification there in terms of their customer base. And you have no single customer forming more than 5% of their total revenues. So if you have a combination like that of recurring revenues like that, that are very, very stable across such a huge portion, like even if like one or two customers go bankrupt, then it's not gonna really affect their total revenue as much um, as opposed to like looking at sort of traditionally safe stocks, like people look at Boeing, people look at Ford and look how they've done. Like I'm sure you could like talk about how it's confirmation bias, um, but I think that it just makes sense to me how um, these uh, companies would be very safe even in recessions and I think that um, the one that we just went through with COVID, I think that that really goes to show because like they were still growing at like very, very high rates um, when every other industry was basically collapsing. And also like just because a company has been around for a long time doesn't mean that it's safe, right? Like just because it's at scale doesn't mean it's safe. Um, like, like I think that, uh, like well, like with the examples I've gave, like they've proven it. Like um, like I don't own any of these uh, sort of cyclical um, old economy stocks, um, and it's not because I don't sort of like cheap investments. Like of course, like I want to buy a stock um, the cheapest I can get it, but most of the times, like good companies, they trade at high multiples, and so I think that uh, really like that shouldn't stop. An investor from investing in them, just like having a cheap multiple loan shouldn't be a reason for investing in a cheap stock. Right. Um, the company really has to have a durable competitive advantage. I, like I look for factors, like I've written out in my own um, newsletter about like sort of the factors, like the sixteen factors that I look for in companies. And you're looking at large, um, large addressable market, you're looking at really optionality, you're looking at great management, you're looking at great product, um, durable moat, um, sort of all of these different factors come to play. And so that's really what I focus on is business quality. I like, I really like that answer too, because I, I do think sometimes sort of diverse revenue streams can almost be a good substitute for diversification within your portfolio. Yeah. And if you're going to diversify at all, um, it, unless you're going to go into maybe an index fund, I think most people would be better to not go into stuff that they don't understand, especially if it's in individual stocks, they're going to be a decent concentration in your portfolio. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Last question. Uh, we asked this to everyone. Uh, what is one piece of advice you would give for anyone starting out in a career in investing, which I guess uh, I hear you're just getting going here. So. Yeah. So like I'd say like, super, super important. Like it's extremely important to be open-minded. I think that a lot of people, like when they come into investing, they come in with really preconceptions. Um, that is like, it could be like a simple bias, like, oh, like um, I don't want to like sort of buy like very expensive stocks. Like I want to go and sort of with uh, looking for cheap undervalued companies or like I want to like, like, like I read this book on like um, intelligent investor and I'm going to stick to that philosophy. I'm going to stick to Buffett's philosophy. You know, like it's really, really important for you to really take in as much information from as many different sources as you can when you're starting out to really form your own investment philosophy and decide if it's really sort of the right style for you. Like the most common question I get when people ask me for investing advice is like, when do I buy and sell a stock? And I'm like, I can't tell you that because I don't know your financial situation here. Like, 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 I don't know your time horizon. I don't know your risk tolerance. I don't know like, um, like, like, like what performance you're aiming for. And so like, that's something that you really have to decide for yourself. And that only comes when you have developed your own investing philosophy 
and sort of um, read as much as you can and sort of decided which area, which um, sector you want to focus on. And so um, I think that that's helped me a lot, like when I started out, just like being open minded, like taking advice from like whoever I can get and like in the rest of my life as well. Like I like to think of myself as like sort of very open minded. Like I tried to come in to any situation with as few preconceptions about something as possible. Um, and sort of really letting data dictate my decision making. All right. Yeah. Thank you for coming on the show, Richard. Uh, had a fun conversation. Great interview. Thanks, guys. Okay. Welcome back in. Thanks again to Richard Chu for joining us. Next, we have Hot Water. I have one. No, I have two. So, two? I have two as well. Go okay, ahead. I'll go first. I'd be remorse. If I didn't mention this, I think everyone knew this was coming. Uh, the funniest thing of all time. The Four Seasons Landscaping IPO is imminent. Yes. Or it's SPAC. Actually, no, it's going to be spac yeah. Uh, but how – I it, mean, someone got fired, right? Yeah, we don't need to uh, – everyone knows what we're talking about. It possibly – and everyone says, oh, this is the funniest thing of all time. It may have been the funniest thing of all time. There, I don't know if there's anything funnier. <laughs> There's an, I mean, if Veep couldn't come up with this, if in the Veep writers room, they're like, yeah, we're going to do this. They'd be like, no, no, no. That's not believable. What do you think they thought when they got there? Like, no, who it, did this? I can't. I would read a whole book on that day. Just like all the figures, all, all the people in the charge. I would read. It's like all the president's men, but this, this election. Version. Okay. And the second one, uh, we're in hot water again because we always bash oh, Robin Hood. But that's true. I'm pretty sure all the major brokerages were down this morning except Robinhood. Yeah, they tweeted. Um, they actually had a they had a subtweet today that <laughs> that they're like, uh, we had all all time traffic this morning, but we actually stayed up. And it's I like, people like, congrats, you did your job. But <laughs> I mean, that's actually it's it's interesting to see. So maybe Robinhood's not as bad. I still think like the stuff we talked about with Bill Brewster last week. Um, it doesn't change the fact that they're basically treating uh trading or sorry investing like social media this is that this is that meme where the guy's like celebrating with champagne on the third place podium but it's all zoomed in on him do you know which one i'm talking about yeah this is what robin hood is doing right now they're celebrating but they're in the midst of like the biggest sort of turmoil they're always there's always something going wrong there yeah i can't wait yeah they just I mean, finally have their day to celebrate yeah each month there's another thing that goes wrong at robin hood all right, those were my only two. What do you have? Okay, PPP loans. Uh, apparently, it was a fraudster free-for-all shocker, so they're in hot water. Um, who knew that Steve Mnuchin wouldn't be for the common people and just giving up money to big businesses? Doesn't he just look like he's doing something wrong? He has yeah, like Goldman. a face of a villain. He looks like he's from Goldman Sachs. That's yeah. all I'll say. Uh, all right. Here's the quote from the Wall Street Journal article. Sorry, don't have the subscription. We're poor over here. Researchers at the MIT in July compared payroll data at PPP eligible companies to ineligible ones and estimated the program had boosted employment by about 2.3 million jobs. At that rate, the PPP would have cost about $224,000 per job supported. That seems inaccurate. No, it seems. No, I mean, that seems like. Not good? Not $224,000 worth for every job. That seems. It's high. High. Yeah, that's that's why it's bad. <laughs> okay. Um, any other hot waters? Yeah, commercial flights are in hot water. This one's more sarcasm because the middle class now is apparently joining the private jet boom. This is a Wired article. Transport. The pandemic has created a middle class private jet boom. With commercial airlines grounded, holiday households are booking business flights to beat local lockdowns. Now, I understand what they may think the middle class is, but there's not one actual middle class person that is booking a private flight. No. I don't know where Wired is getting this. Yeah. Wired <laughs> and The Onion were on fire this week with terrible headlines, so I don't know. Just classify them as the same at this point. Yeah, middle class, 1%, Hamptons, same deal. Okay, uh, any others? Nope. Okay, buy, sell, hold. The theme this week is companies that would significantly benefit from a vaccinated population. Uh, I have Norwegian Cruise Lines, Starbucks, and Boeing. I don't like Boeing just because of the executive team. I think they have a tough corporate history over the last few years. 737 Max was obviously a horrible tragedy. 
uh, but it's a lot sta- It's a lot more stable than the Norwegian Cruise Lines. I'd have to look at Norwegian Cruise Lines balance sheet. So that I'm... might be something where I hold and then I'm selling Boeing and I'm definitely buying Starbucks because I think it's a quality business, although they have fueled their buybacks with debt. Um, it's not something I'd likely own either any of these companies, but out of these three, Starbucks is solid. Norwegian Cruise Line's revenue was down ninety nine point seven percent this quarter. <laughs> yeah, if I knew that number, maybe I go. To, maybe I put that on the sell. <laughs> maybe, maybe they go back to sell. Listen, even if like maybe you bought a few bonds to save you for this time, but if it takes another year, it's going to take them so long to pay off the debt. Even if they do survive, yeah, that doesn't just because people got vaccinated or will get vaccinated doesn't mean that makes this a good investment. Well, same thing with Boeing, right? Because yeah. they they've had the they had to fund their, ah uh, gosh what was it pension, or something or no something they had to fund something that was already fueled by debt with more debt um, and it's just concerning and they're susceptible to airlines being insolvent like airlines yeah. might have problems and then who does Boeing sell to I guess maybe there's consolidation but I still don't know if commercial flying goes back to where it was ever at. Uh yeah well I guess commercial if you separate it out to business business probably won't be where it's ever at it may get back who knows the exact number seventy percent of what it was okay anecdotal evidence um I got pulled over this week speeding wow yeah and the guy came up to the window and he like tapped on it and I rolled it down he's like and he said he just did like, you buy a Tesla. <laughs> <laughs> said just want you to know you're being recorded with audio and video i oh. really got so bullish on axon yes sir they just had a great you. report i actually thought that was like an actual anecdote i was like yeah hmm. i was like that that an axon camera but probably is yeah no. got out of it sweet talked him nice but, did you just give him a stock pick yeah no of course <laughs> but no yeah, I you actually out. hey buy uh you actually should buy uh nicolo <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right uh what do you have okay there has been a lot of news about forgiveness of student loans. I think there was a senator, not sure which, that did it. Um, it sounds good in theory, but the student loan stuff, forgiveness, it doesn't make sense. There's a good tweet here from Drew Dixon. He said, a student loan bailout is unfair to those have, who have foregone college already. It's unfair to those who have gone and paid back their loans and particularly unfair to the less fortunate in the future who want to go but won't be able to secure loans as easily. Now, does this feel like something – in the financial world where you're treating a symptom and you're not treating the actual problem, which is college is expensive and bloated with high administrative costs that, you know, all these administrators pay getting paid in the high six figures that um, you know, aren't providing as many value much value yeah. to students. Yeah, I don't think bailing out student loans is a great idea. And my thing yeah, so the underlying problem is university is too expensive. And the underlying problem beneath that is the system has made it so that People feel like they need college or people go to college without hoping for the degree but not the education. Yeah. And so my solution has always been lower the drinking age to 18 for the United <laughs> States. Yeah. I'm telling you, that's going to filter out the people that just want to party and they'll stay home and just go to the bars. And the people that actually want to study and get educated and then if they need loans to do it, at least they're getting an education so they can hopefully pay those off. Like it's not going to be a bunch of student loans that aren't like payable. Yeah, you get a degree that actually uh, makes sense. I don't yeah. know. That's my solution. But... Yeah, look. <laughs> yeah, or I mean, or you just issue a bunch of money and Joe Biden, are you listening? Make this guy yeah. the education czar. Yeah, I'm I'm free these next few years if you need someone. Yeah, you're not doing anything. Uh, but yeah, I won't... I'm not a fan of it. Yeah, I am not either. But um... I also don't. I don't know. I'm probably the. I'm the preppy one without student loans. So as someone that doesn't have it, it's really easy to say I'm not a fan of that. But Yeah, it is true without having the – I mean it's not like we don't feel bad for the people that had to take them out. you know. But yeah. it's not solving the issue for everyone. All right, last one I have here. WhatsApp launched payments in India. Do you mm-hmm. think this can be as big as a Venmo or Cash App in the United States where it's probably yeah. – it could potentially be a $100 billion business? My only question is does a $100 billion business move the needle that much for Facebook anymore? Yeah, yeah, it moves the needle for Facebook. Oh, what is it? Hundred billion in what revenue or market value? Oh, like what? Maybe. That's a twenty percent. I can boost see boost to the market cap. Like, Ten. That's just one of those businesses that has always made sense, like text payments to one another. Yeah, the WhatsApp. I mean, maybe it's bigger than a hundred billion dollars, but 
Um, I mean, I like it. I, I guess why not? I, I guess why not do it? But yeah. it's it's kind of the thing about when I talk or think about the law of large numbers for these companies. WhatsApp payments in India seems like a fantastic opportunity, but I mean, come on, this thing's almost a trillion dollars. As an investor, I would love to see these companies get broken up. Oh, I know. There's so many parts of the business that I would love to own. AWS, Instagram, YouTube, WhatsApp. What if they start trying to monetize? Yeah, I get I get mad because <laughs> they're just locked up in these conglomerates. Okay, well, that's going to do it for this week. Remember, definitely don't sign up using our code CCM for 7investing unless Never you did. want great advice with great picks. Um, for $10 but, off. Right. Um, and then you can message us on Twitter, shout us out or whatever you want. If you want us to do a show, just feel free to message us on Twitter or email us, chitchatmoneypodcast at gmail.com. Uh, we are not financial advisors. Anything we say or discuss here on Chit Chat Money is not formal advice or recommendation. Thank you guys for listening. We'll see you next week.